Most people who die in the wilderness do so because they've wandered off the path and they haven't got the skill set to survive in that environment. In our case, in the times that we live in, we might find ourselves deliberately wandering into the wilderness at some point. But whatever the scenario that you find yourself in, if you're lost in the wilderness or you're trying to survive there long term, you're going to need certain skills to keep you going. In this video, I've drawn up a survival skills shortlist that will help you to prioritize your needs and make sure that you survive in the wilderness. I'm Clarice, welcome to the Liberty Channel. Before you set up a shelter, you preferably want to have a look around and see if you can find water. What most people don't know is that you can actually use your compass to navigate to water, and I'll show you that in a second. If you're unsure what your survival priorities should be, then ask yourself what's going to kill me first in this environment. Around here, what's going to kill me first is probably the sun or a leopard. Unfortunately, I've got no way of ensuring that the leopards don't attack me, but I can just watch my six. Now I found a nice shady spot over here and I think we'll sit down here and make a little field compass. The reason why I say we can actually navigate to water using our compass is because if we have a relative idea of where we are, let's say southern hemisphere, we know the sun passes east to west but because I'm in South Africa the sun is going to pass due north of me which means that it casts a shadow on the southern side of rocky outcrops and of mountains. I'm more likely to find water where there is more shade because the sun's going to be less likely to evaporate that water. So that moisture will accumulate even just on the side of the mountain. It might go underground but it's going to push downwards and if I then find that the slope of the mountain um, forms a valley I'm more likely to find water in that area than I am on the northern slope of a mountain while I'm in the southern hemisphere. Obviously the reverse applies if you're in the northern hemisphere. So if you don't have a compass and for whatever reason you can't tell where north is, maybe it's overcast and you can't tell where the sun is, you can make a quick field compass by magnetizing a needle. In my case I'm going to pour a little bit of water into my canteen cup. Are you thirsty? You can drink that so long. Yeah, staying hydrated is important, hey doggy. Using a needle for my gear repair kit, you can use a bobby pin like a hairpin or a safety pin or anything like that. I'm going to magnetize this needle really quickly just using my knife. So this is a 1095 Crovan steel knife. It will magnetize the needle. I need to just scrape on the one side of the needle, so just the one half of this needle. I'm busy polarizing using my knife and just about 40 times should do the trick. Okay. Once I've done that, I can take a small leaf. In this case, I've just cut a little piece of grass. I'm going to lay my needle on my leaf and then whatever water Indy hasn't drank, drop that there, sort of want it to float nicely. And if it is magnetized, you'll see it immediately starts to turn and reorientate itself. Okay, so you can see quite clearly the thick part that I magnetized has reoriented itself. It's now pointing in that direction. That is going to give us north. If you're unsure, disturb it. Put my needle on my grass. See, immediately it starts orientating itself again. It overshoots and returns. So that is definitely going to give us north. If you're still not convinced, I do have a lensatic compass and we can see whether the field compass and the lensatic compass show us the same direction as north. North on the lensatic compass and north on the field compass. So my field compass is saying that direction over there is north, which means south is that way. That means that I'm sitting pretty much on the southwestern side of the big mountain behind me. And there's a high chance that if I go over this ridge here, I'll find water or at least really damp soil on the other side. Now that would make a good spot for me to dig down and to try and find water 
below the soil if whatever body of water was there before has dried up. In that way I'm going to minimize the amount of energy that I expend trying to find water and I'm going to increase my chances of finding water using my little field compass here. Right, let's go see if we can find water. So building a field compass is not the only way that you can determine where north is in the wilderness. There are a couple of other ways. You can use an analog watch. Um, I go through a lot of other means to figure out which side is north in a dedicated video on field compass navigation. You can go and check that out. I'll link it here. Right, we're just about to go over this ridge. Let's see whether we can find some water on the other side. Lo and behold, water. Not too bad, hey? A whole river. I need to consider when I approach a body of water that I'm not the only one who wants that water. The animals are also going to be flocking towards that water because they also need to drink. And not only are there apex predators on land, but there are also predators inside the water. On top of that, I need to be weary of disease in and around the water. The other thing I need to look out for in the wilderness is other people. Not every person I come across in the wilderness is going to have good intentions. So if I'm approaching a body of water, I'm exposing myself in the open um, to whoever and whatever is also in the area. So my advice is sit tight for a few minutes, just watch the area, watch the water, make sure you're the only one approaching that body of water and see if there are safe places where you can approach the water. The bend of a river is usually a concealed place where you can access the water without being spotted. Just remember, just because the water is running or it looks clear doesn't mean it's good to drink. As you go along, see if you can find signs that people or other animals have been in the environment because they'll be coming to drink and most likely at night as well. Right, let's go. When we're in the wilderness, we can easily let our minds race away with potential threats and possibilities of disaster. But don't let your thoughts get the better of you. In the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, the Bible tells us that our warfare and our strife is not against the physical, not what we see around us, but against the spiritual. It encourages us to bring every thought into captivity. So when you're in the wilderness, bring your thoughts into submission before Christ and allow His peace to come over you. You'll never be alone. It doesn't matter how lonesome it feels. God will never leave you nor forsake you. So take on each obstacle as you get to it. Now I'm approaching the water here fast and on the other side of the river, I've seen that it looks like there might be a small forest there. It would be ideal to try and cross the river to get to the small forest as that will provide me with firewood and also possibly a safe place to build a shelter. Just along the water course here, I found a skeleton of some or the other animal. Um, I haven't quite determined what it is yet, but this tells me a couple of things. First of all, there's an animal that died here. It might have been from natural causes, it might have been from drinking the water, or there might have been a predator in the environment that hunted this animal. If I can find any teeth marks or places where the bones have been broken, such as right over there, that might tell me that the bones have been gnawed on and that this was an animal attack. I may suspect that it might have been a predator um, that attacked this animal and that will give me early warning that there are predators in the environment. And we'll go and light a fire with that. If you can, don't pass by any resources in your environment. Try and collect them as you go, especially edible plants, because you don't know whether you're going to be able to fish or hunt something or to find food in any other way on that very same day. Sometimes it can take a while before you find food. So if you find an edible resource, something that can help you to put a few calories in your body, collect that, keep it in your bag, even if you're not hungry at the moment. The same goes for water. If you can fill up with water, you have the opportunity to fill your water bottle, then do so. Just remember that the gold standard for water is still to boil it in order to be able to drink it. Not all water filtration systems on the market remove viruses and bacteria. So we've reached the water, but it's such an enormous body of water. For me to swim across this river is an enormous risk. First of all, there may be predators in that water um, and I don't want to risk myself getting halfway through the river 
and then either drowning because the dog is on top of me or um, some of the other predator gets to me. So I'm gonna go a little bit further along the river and see if I can find a safer place to cross. I'm quite fortunate in that I have a base layer in my bag that I can change into once I've gotten to the other side. That's gonna help me to change into something dry. So I've come a little further along the river and when it comes to river crossings, you always want to start your crossing upstream of where you want to end. So if I want to end downstream, I've got to start around here somewhere. The current of the river is going to push me downstream and I've got to use that to my advantage in order to get across. Now lucky for me, it hasn't rained in a couple of days and this river is not in flood, but I have made a dedicated video on surviving river crossings. So if you do need to cross a river that is in flood, go and check out that video. You always want to unhook your bag, especially your breast buckle um, from your bag. You can even only sling it over one shoulder to make sure that you're safe and that your gear doesn't snag on anything inside the water. I don't know how deep this is so I'm, I'm kind of bargaining on that I'll probably have to swim some part of the way. And there are a couple of things that I would ideally like to keep dry. Some of which is my maps, my clothing, my shoes, and any electronic equipment that you've got also needs to stay dry. For that I have a dry bag, so all the important stuff is going to go in here. I usually keep this plastic bag around so that if I need to make a solar still or gather water by transpiration, I've got a plastic bag with which to do that. Um, the other advantage of this is that you can make a quick makeshift shelter with it and of course keep your gear dry. You want a set of dry clothes and a set of wet clothes. You change into your dry clothes at camp and your wet clothes you wear during the day so that you've always got a set of dry clothes to sleep in. So here's some rope that's going to help me get down this ledge. The other thing that I really want to keep dry, oh, where is it, is my fire kit. I really want to keep that dry because if I get out on the other side and this water is freezing cold, then at least I've got something to start a fire to warm myself up with. My jacket, or whatever sleeping system you've got, you also want to keep that dry. As I'm closing this, any extra air that's in here is going to help this bag to float so that your bag doesn't sink if you drop it and it can help you with a bit of extra buoyancy. Because not all rivers are easy to get into and out of, I'm going to make use of this stick and a bit of rope just to help me down here. I don't want to jump into the river because I don't know what's down there. So just to be safe, I'm going to just do two bowline knots around this and make a little rope for myself to climb down with at all. And then I'm just going to make a few handholds for myself. We want to avoid having to cross rivers in the first place and when we do have to cross a river we never want to cross where there are rapids and we never want to cross where the river or the speed of the water is faster than walking speed. Ideally you also don't want to have to cross the river where it's deeper than thigh depth. Make sure that you never approach rocks from the upriver side, always approach them from below, from downriver. While you're in the water, make sure that every step is secure before you commit to it. Sometimes there are loose rocks or things that shift around. Um, there can sometimes be sharp objects, either rocks or sticks or debris underneath the water. There's always a risk of hypothermia, even if it's a nice sunny day, the air temperature is cool, the water temperature is going to be even colder than that and once I'm through the water I'm going to want to try and get warm as quickly as possible and we always try to keep our shoes dry. So I did quite well with my grappling hook but man that water is cold. First signs of hypothermia, shivering, uh, difficulty with fine motor skills. I've got to get warm and in the two space blanket, got to dry off my clothes. I'm just going to wring out the worst of the wetness. Luckily there's quite a bit of sunshine left and um, the activity will help me to dry off. Any call a ride on the bag. So yeah, there is merit in actually inflating the stuff in your bag and using that as a float. 
So with my clothes hanging up to dry, what I've done is I've changed into my dry base layer. This allows me to warm up while my clothes dry out, but I do see some clouds incoming. For me to prevent hypothermia, what I need to do is separate the general macroclimate from the microclimate that immediately surrounds my body. So I need to create a barrier. I'm going to do that using a space blanket or a mylar blanket. The other thing that I need to do is remove anything that's wet from around me. So I've changed out of my wet clothes and while they hang up, I've changed into my base layer. Now this is a merino wool base layer. I usually keep it in my bag so that I have something dry to change in. Ideally, you want a dry set of clothes and a wet set of clothes. You wear the wet set of clothes during the day. You wear the dry set of clothes at night so that you don't sleep in wet clothing and you don't have to become hypothermic and you don't deal with the temperature. Doggy. So I'm going to take my space blanket which admittedly is a bit wet, even though it was in a plastic bag inside my bag. My actual bag is still wet as well. The second thing I'm gonna do is from my fire kit, take a small tea candle. You can use anything that will burn for emergency fire making. This is when you use your gas. Put that inside the mylar blanket with me. If you've got a wool blanket, you can use a wool blanket or even a jacket to do this. It may seem like a small thing, but it really makes a huge difference to sit in here versus the cold air out there. What I've effectively done is created a microclimate in here. I've got a pocket of air that I'm busy warming through this little candle. I've removed all of the cold, wet stuff from inside the shelter, so my wet clothes are outside drying in the sun. I don't know how dry they're actually going to get, but at least I won't be losing heat through conduction because I'm wearing wet clothes. There's a little bit of cold air coming from my left elbow. There must be a gap somewhere in the blanket there. Before you get into the water, remember that wedding rings and sunglasses don't float. So if you've got anything that's really valuable, try and stow it away in your bag or even in one of your pockets. Make it safe. If you lose your bag, it might float down the river, it might sink. Um, and you might lose those items. If there's something valuable, try and stow it away somewhere safe. Um, keep wedding rings and things like that in safe places before you get into the water. Hey, yeah, it's a game trail. <laughs> there are a couple of other ways that you can locate water in the wilderness. One of those is to keep an eye out for game trails. So pretty much what Indy came in on now is quite a thick game trail. And then there's a smaller, narrower trail branching off to the left here, or my left. And then there's a another small trail branching off to the right. There are a couple in the area, but this one seems to be really thick or really wide, which tells me that a lot of the game travel on this path and then they sort of split up and diverge in separate directions when they go on the smaller paths. Uh-huh. Which is interesting because we have to then ask ourselves, why are all the game going on this path here? So usually game trails converge because the animals trek towards water. So all of the animals go in this direction. So I'm suspecting that there's another body of water coming up on this side. And then when they come back from the water, they split up and go in their separate directions again. So it's one way to try and tell whether you are approaching water um, in the wilderness is to keep an eye out for converging game trails. If you do find that there used to be a body of water, but the water has gone underground, it's dried up, maybe it's a dry riverbed, you can try and dig for water in that riverbed or nearby that riverbed. It's always safer to try and dig a seep well or what's also called a coyote well um, nearby a water source because that soil between the water source and where you are digging the well is going to drain and filter the water that you're going to drink. Even though it is filtered, it's still safest to boil that water, but it's better to drink from a coyote well or a seep well than it is um, to drink directly from a water source like a river. Even if the water is clear, that river may be contaminated by a dead animal upstream. Um, maybe there's a village somewhere up in the mountains and the village is contaminating the water. So I suspect that I'm approaching another body of water here. Hopefully it's not a particularly big one because I don't really feel like getting wet and swimming again, um, but we'll have to see about that. So I've done a little recce and I am correct in saying this game trail does actually lead to another body of water. Um, the animals will come to drink down here. Luckily it's not a huge river, I don't have to swim through it, but it's deep enough for me to need to take my shoes off and walk through barefoot, which doesn't sound like fun. We have some seriously venomous snakes in the area. 
So plowing through this bush here, not, not my idea of fun. Okay, shoes off, doggy. So I'm gonna keep my boots dry so as not to have to walk around in wet shoes. Okay, just like that. Okay, shoes go around the neck. Ready, let's go. Oh, there's some prickly bushes here. the bushes up oh, and we get the water. So we're through the river. That's how deep it is. <laughs> At least um, I didn't have to swim through, but it was a bit deeper than I thought. And I should actually ideally have undone my waist belt on my bag and just flung it over one shoulder, but I underestimated how deep that water was. Um, so there's a lesson learned. Now I can get dry once again, put my shoes back on and start looking for a campsite. Come doggy. So the weather has changed and quite quickly at that too. So doggy and I had to quickly get into our raincoats and cover all our gear. Make sure that this stays dry. Don't know whether I mentioned this before, but having a plastic bag can be a great way to improvise a makeshift shelter um, should a storm suddenly come up which is the case here but this is the western cape the temperatures and the weather just changes all the time so we've quickly jumped into our raincoat and i'm pretty sure it's going to pass soon i hope so anyway and then doggy and i are just sitting maybe we're just sitting inside the plastic bag avoiding getting absolutely soaked and um We'll go on a little bit later. Can't see much out there. But it is still raining. Don't be discouraged if you have to make up some or the other shelter with whatever you've got on hand. Maybe you've only got a plastic bag like what I'm sitting underneath now. But that might be enough to keep you dry. Resting is as much of a human need as what water and food is. Um, you can absolutely wear yourself down by trying to scuttle around, trying to build shelters and find water and whatever. And by the time you've done so, you find you're so exhausted that you start to suffer mentally and emotionally. And you can't actually cope with the emotional circumstances that you find yourself in. I've been sitting here with my eyes closed, just trying to get a bit of rest. And um, from carrying around quite a heavy bag with lots of equipment, and trekking through the wilderness where there is really no path. Um, I am actually quite tired, so I'm happy to just sit down and take a moment to breathe and rest, consider what my priorities are, consolidate my thoughts and regroup before we go further. I think that's pretty much the end of the rain. Just a slight drizzle left. Doggy's gonna risk it. Doggy's gonna risk it. <laughs> This is some really thick bush that we have to travel through. I've gotten a little sidetracked by a survival resource that I really recommend everybody keep an eye out for in the wilderness. And it's something we find all over the place, the humble pine tree. Pine is so widespread and it has so many uses and applications in survival. 
Um, first of all, I see that there's a little bit of resin that's running out underneath one of these broken branches. And I can easily use that to start a fire and to keep my fire going for a while, especially because now that most of the resources in the environment are wet, I'm going to need something that burns quite warm and for quite a while for me to get my fire started. The other thing is I noticed over here is a pine cone that's fallen down. It's not completely open, which means that I'm still going to be able to get some pine nuts from this pine cone. As it happens, doggy can eat pine nuts. Um, so pine nuts are not toxic to dogs, but obviously because they have such a high fat content, we want to be careful how much of it we feed to them. Um, but things like num nooms, for example, dogs can't eat. So some of the berries in the environment that I can eat, Indy can't eat. So this is gonna be great, I can feed this to her. On top of that, if I can get a hold of some of the pine needles up there, um, I can use that to create pine needle tea. So I'll just boil a little bit of water, let it cool down, put my pine needles inside that I've bruised and um, all of the vitamin C and the vitamin A in those pine needles will seep out into my tea and I've got a really high vitamin T um, that I can use to warm me up as well. It's always better to try and drink warm water or a tea rather than cold water or to try and eat ice because your body is going to lose so much heat trying to warm up that water really do yourself a favor, warm your water before you drink it. Make some pine needle tea. All right, let's see how much of this I can harvest. If this was standing dead, would it would actually be a pretty good um, candidate for a bow drill kit. Uh, there are some dead branches here. The other thing that makes pine a brilliant survival resource is fatwood. So fatwood is basically the resinous hardwood of a pine tree. And if this branch was still whole and I cut into it, I'd probably find there's quite a bit of fatwood inside here. At the moment it's hard to tell oh, no, there's not much in there but usually you could find quite a bit of fatwood um, in the branches of the tree and the way you can tell whether it's fatwood or not is it would have this resinous smell to it um, also gives it that caramel kind of color it's that congealed um, resin that sits inside that wood so you're able to tell that, that you've got fatwood quite easily um, and it takes a spark really quickly from say a ferro rod and it also burns quite well. Keep some of the fatwood from the pine tree, take a pine cone, you can get the pine nuts out by just putting it near a fire. It will help um, to open this pine cone up and then I can feed the pine nuts to Indy and I can make some tea with this. So I'm just gonna stuff it in my bag along with all the other things that I've been gathering along the way. Found another pine tree I did, this time with some more easily attainable resources. And um, this seems to be quite dry. Not all pine trees are edible though. Um, there are some poisonous pines like the ponderosa pine, the yew, the Australian pine. So do your research and know the pines in your area well. White pine, red pine is usually perfectly fine to go for. Um, so we can make some tea from this. So what I've got with me is my bow drill kit, my current kit. Um, I lost my previous bow, so I've just grabbed this one from the branches in the area. Um, and I've got a little spindle and an old hearth board that I've used a couple of times. Now I'm running into a knot over here, so I'm going to start either on this side or on the opposite side, possibly over here. That might be it. Okay, so I'll make another notch. Um, so just to score a notch, quick and easy. Now, <clears throat> this is by no means a comprehensive video on how to make bow drill fires. Let me move this up a little bit over there. That actually warrants a video all by itself. This is pine. Um, it is dry. I harvested it from a standing um, dead pine. The principles behind a bow drill fire is that you're using a spindle to drill into your hearth board. What it does is it creates sawdust and a lot of heat and from that spinning in the hearth board that sawdust accumulates on what we call a dust pan or a catch pan over there and because you're generating heat the sawdust consolidates into an ember and it's that ember that you then transfer into a tinder bundle or a little tinder nest that you've prepared beforehand this over here is um, just my bearing block it's a piece of wood that I fire hardened because I don't want my drill to drill through my bearing block. I wanted to drill um, into and through my hearth board. 
So this needs to be really hard. This should preferably be a soft wood and this should really be a soft wood. My bow is about arm's length. Now that my initial burn-in is done, or at least some of it, I can start to cut my notch. And I ideally just want an eighth of that to come out. And I'm gonna score it so that my wood doesn't break away. And then I'm going to very patiently cut out that notch. The purpose of the notch is just to allow oxygen to get to the sawdust so that it can consolidate and form a coal or an ember. So I have to seat my spindle nicely in here, get my set to work together really nicely to basically run smoothly um, and then finish my burn in until I'm about halfway through, which I'm nearly, and then I can go for an ember. My catch pan in there. That's going to catch my ember. Hopefully. spindle all set up. As far as bow drill fires go, it's not the first thing that you start looking for in a survival situation. It takes a lot of energy to make a bow drill kit, to find the materials that you need for a bow drill kit, and then to drill for fire. So if you haven't been eating properly, the last thing you want is to spend a lot of time and energy trying to get a bow drill fire going. Now that my initial burn-in is done and I've accumulated a nice bit of sawdust here, I can go for an ember. Ideally, what you would do is, if you're really cold and vulnerable, you would use your lighter. Once you have recovered your core body temperature and you've settled in, you've had something to eat, the following fires can be made using a ferro rod, unless you have enough energy and enough time to start a ferro rod fire and it's not an absolute emergency, then you leave the gas for later. And when you've been um, eating properly, you've had a bit of time to search for materials, then do you start looking for the things that you need for a bow drill fire kit. I think we've got an ember. Just letting it sit there for a moment. Notice how I've stopped drilling, but there's still smoke. Okay, I'm gonna remove my spindle very carefully. It's smoking, so I've got an ember. I'm just gonna lift my foot very carefully. Now, I don't wanna move it too fast but I sort of want to get my little bird's nest ready. I can now just release this here. Take my little bird's nest that I've prepared with some soft burny stuff. Move my ember, transfer it to my bird's nest. Close it in there. I don't have a whole lot of tinder here. And just like that, I've got a bow drill fire. Okay, I've prepared some kindling. Make sure that you've got all your fire making materials ready before you even start on the bow drill. I think I'm going to move my fire. That way. So that by the time you get fire, you're ready with everything you need. In all the excitement, I put my bow on the fire as well. 
Luckily I saved the paracord because that's difficult to get a hold of in the bush. So just here in the forest there are so many berries growing and I've managed to pick some num nums which are a great resource for me but Indy can't eat those. So I'm going to have to find something else for her to eat. They're just red berries that basically grow all over the world today. They're called Natal plums as well. And they're a nice sweet little red berry that I can feast on that's really high in calories and that'll keep me going until I've managed to hunt or trap something. There are lots of bird nests around here as well so I can try and see if I can find some eggs. Um, and there are ground birds here too so they may also have left some nests for me to forage from. When selecting a campsite, you want to make sure that you're somewhere nearby water, but not on top of water. Remember, the animals are going to track to the water, especially at night. We want to make sure that we're not on a game trail so that the animals don't come traipsing through our campsite. We want lots of wood for fire. We want some wood for shelter building, and we want a relatively flat space to lie down on, especially if you're going to build something like a debris shelter. Um, because that's going to mean that you didn't bring all of your usual camping stuff along. So try to make it as comfortable a night's sleep for yourself as possible. First thing I want to do if I'm building a survival shelter is protect my hands. If I injure one of my hands, I'm going to struggle to make fire, I'm going to struggle to hunt, to trap. Even just general everyday tasks can become really difficult if you've sliced your hand on a branch or something. So I'm going to use my gloves to clean out this area, remove most of the branches and the twigs and the leaves, um, and then put something soft down to make a bed. Unfortunately, that does mean having to remove some of the plants. Um, I'm about 50 meters away from the water. I don't want to be any closer to it. I can actually track further away from it, but then I'm also not having a lot of trees. So I want to just use whatever is in my environment to my advantage and to shelter me from the worst of the elements. The sun is back out and I've got a couple hours to still build my shelter and get a fire started. There's lots of debris in the area, lots of broken branches that are lying down, so I don't even need to saw anything down. I can literally just take what's on the ground and use that to build my shelter. Let's stay right. Now that I've basically got the frame of my shelter set up, I want to insulate it, I want to cover it so that if it rains again, that the rainwater just runs off the shelter and that I retain some heat when I'm inside my shelter. For that, I'm going to use all of the branches and the twigs and the grass that I pulled out of the ground to make space for me to sleep to cover the sides of the shelter. So I've built myself a shelter here. It's just big enough for Indian eye to fit in underneath here. Um, and will stay warm because it is insulated with all of the grass and the leaves in the area. With my shelter built, I can now build a bed for myself. So I've cut some grass um, and some foliage from the area. The stuff is nice and soft, so I'm gonna lay this down on the ground to make it soft, a nice soft bed for myself. But I also want my bed to insulate me. So for that, I'm gonna use a space blanket or a mylar blanket. So this is the same one I used earlier prevent hypothermia. I keep a couple of these in my bag. You can never go wrong with them. They're not all durable, so it helps to have a couple. So the mylar will help me to stay warm because it's gonna reflect my heat back to me. With my mylar blanket now flat on the ground, I can take my soft foliage and make a bed on top of that. use my jacket as a blanket. Switch all the stuff in under me. There we go. 
and I can use my jacket as a blanket. And this way I should be able to stay warm for the night with my fire burning outside, my shelter insulated. I've got an insulating bed and mattress underneath me. I'm using my bag as a pillow and my waterproof jacket is going to be my blanket. Now make no mistake, none of this is quick work. All of this takes time and a lot of energy. So by the time you've got a shelter up and a bed like this, you're going to be absolutely exhausted. And if you're going to be active like this, you're going to need kilojoules in order to sustain you and you're going to need water as well. Remember that if you're going to metabolize food, you're also going to need water. It's equally important to allow yourself some time to rest. It doesn't help you find food and you find water, but you're so busy that you're absolutely burning yourself out. You need to take some time to rest. So even if it's just an hour or two in a day um, while you're trying to get home, take that time to close your eyes, fall asleep, just forget about what's going on around you, forget about your situation and just capitalize on some shut eye. Now I want to start a fire because the fire is also going to help me to stay warm during the night. So I'm just going to take all of this grass and make it into a really fine tinder bundle. You should have your wood as well. So all of mine is lying over here. I've stacked a whole bunch of wood um, for, for my fire so that I have enough wood. I want to collect enough wood during daylight hours before it starts getting dark. So making a bow drill fire, even though you've got a mechanical advantage, is great. But you must remember that you still have to go and search for the materials. And on top of that, you've got to first make the bow drill kit. So if you haven't eaten a lot, um, because you haven't been so successful in foraging, there's my fire kit. Remember that from before I crossed the river. And in here, I've got a couple of options. One of my favorites is a ferro rod because it does not fail. A ferro rod will always give you fire. There we go. And I've cleared the area around here just so that I have enough space to make a fire without setting the bush on fire. So I'm stacking some rocks around my fire and this is a dual purpose. Firstly, it keeps my fire from spreading into the surrounding bush. I don't want to start a bush fire here. It is quite dense bush. So I've removed all of the nearest bushes and branches and I've separated that with some stones. The second purpose that they have is they are going to get hot now. These rocks around my fire are going to really absorb all of that heat from the fire. And then when I'm ready to go to bed, what I can do is take my hot rocks and I can put them inside my shelter. Those hot rocks are going to release a lot of heat for a period of time and that's going to help to heat the inside of my shelter as well. Different kinds of stones retain heat for different periods. Um, the more dense the stone is, the longer it's going to retain that heat and the more heat it's going to provide your shelter. But that's something that you're going to have to have a look at, experiment with different stones. The kind of shaley white river stones that we tend to find in riverbeds um, I find don't actually work that well but this really dense stuff um, is pretty good for hot rocks. Now that I've got my fire going I can make some pine needle tea as well. So I've got my canteen here. I'm just going to take out the cup and all of the water that I've accumulated um, I can now boil on my fire too. So pine needle tea is great because it's really high in vitamin C and vitamin A. They used to use pine needles um, or pine needle tea to treat scurvy. So I can take my little canteen, put it on my fire and warm that up. The other thing that I can do to keep myself warm is to actually warm my canteen um, of water and put that inside my shelter with me as well. That will act as a hot water bottle put that guy over here but what you're looking for for pine nuts or collecting pine nuts are these closed cones so you want to be able to see that it's completely solid there the minute it starts opening up like this one over here 
um, the pine nuts start to flutter out. And usually on white pine and on red pine, they have these little wings on them. It's stuck in there now. So to get the pine nuts out of here, all I've got to do is literally just put that nearby a fire. The heat from the fire is going to cause it to open up. So I don't want to burn it. I'm just going to put it where it's really nice and warm. So my water is simmering. I can take that off. It's got a bit of ash in here now. So I just want to bruise with the spine of my knife, these pine needles. I can now put them inside my warm water and just let them steep there. As far as foraging and finding foods in the wilderness goes, it's nice to have mushrooms or leafy greens, but this isn't going to provide me with enough calories for me to continue going in the wilderness. I need to find things like num nums, I need to find things like berries or honey. I can search for eggs, high protein foods or high caloric foods that will keep me going and give me the energy that I need. So I reckon this water is warm enough now I don't need to boil the water that's in my canteen for me to be able to use it as a hot water bottle. Now I can take my canteen of warm water, put it back in its pouch, and I can use that in my shelter as a hot water bottle. That's gonna help me to stay warm. Now, as I've stoked this fire, it's gotten bigger, it's spilled over onto the rocks and that's really going to help me to heat these rocks up and put some nice hot rocks inside my shelter. As far as fire safety goes, you want to make sure that your fire is at least a meter away from your shelter. If you're going to build a long log fire um, by using just really long logs, um, that's going to last a bit longer throughout the night. It's going to warm more of your shelter. But if you've got a closed shelter like this, it's not going to help you to get that much heat into your shelter. So at the moment, this is perfectly fine for me. And um, <clears throat> I just want to make sure that all of the shrubs and all of the bushes around are um, far enough away and I've cleared a large enough space so that I don't set the bush on fire. I reckon these stones are warm enough now. I'm going to start stacking some inside my shelter to start warming up the air inside the shelter. It will create a microclimate that will help me to stay warm through the night. And now because these stones are really warm, you obviously don't want to put them near something that will either melt or um, will ignite really easily. And as I'm going to take them out, yeah, I can feel that's warm. I'm also going to replace them with new ones. Oh, that's hot. Well, I can actually feel that through the glove. So I take one off and replace it with another. Take my fire, take a hot rock off. You can see where the fire has actually warmed it and charred it a bit. And stack them as I go along. Replace it with another. Lucky I've got quite a big pile of rocks here. As I'm stacking these rocks, I have to take note that part of the rock, the inside that's been facing the fire, is going to be much warmer than the side that's been facing away from the fire. So I'm stacking them in such a way that they're going to release heat towards the inside of the shelter, not out of the shelter, because then I'm going to lose the heat from those rocks. Because they are really hot, I just have to be careful when I'm getting in and out that I don't end up burning myself. You know, sitting out here in the wilderness, I just think of one of my favorite scriptures is Deuteronomy 32 verse 10. And it says he found him in a desert land in the waste howling wilderness and he led him about he instructed him and he kept him as the apple of his eye and i personally think it's why so many of the prophets and jesus himself were led into the wilderness is because god's presence here is so magnified once you remove the smog and the distractions of city or of um, the built-up world then we start to actually connect with god and I think it's also a cleansing process for us. I can warm my tea a bit. So don't feel like because you're alone in the wilderness, you are absolutely forsaken. God's presence can be wherever you go. You just actually have to ask him to join you there. 
I've taken my pine cone eye and it basically has opened up because of the heat and it makes these little winged leaves come free that once pine nut has come out it's lying over there. So I'm just going to open this up here and those little wing things down there are pine nuts. There's one right over there. And that over there is a pie nut. So I still have to crack the little shell to get to the actual nut. It doesn't seem like a bit of work. And then I just have to open the shell and out comes the little pie nut. I don't know if you can even see that. The yellowish part on the inside is the nut and it's just sitting inside its shell. Now I can take that nut out. I'm going to do it without breaking it. If you're just going to eat it, you're not going to worry about breaking it. But to show you, there's a pine nut, and there's a whole bunch of them in that pine cone that I can now take and eat. Every trap has got your snare system and it's got your trigger system. So basically the snare that I'm building is the actual trap and the trigger system is what's going to set the trap off. What I've done is I've basically cut lengths of poles or sticks um, going from shortest to longest. Basically I need two of each length of these and to build the actual trap to put it together. I've kept a fork of one of the branches um, I might need it as a pulley system. I'll see about how I'm going to do that. And then I've also got what's going to be a windlass. Um, I'm going to use some paracord as well to set this up. Then I'm quickly going to make a trigger and then I should have everything. Let's do that quick. Silky pocket boy. Okay. So I sawed halfway in on this side and I sawed halfway in on that side. And now when I break it, I get two equal parts that basically fit onto one another just like that. I'm going to make it a little bit finer um, so that it creates what we call a hair trigger um, that is very sensitive and it sets, gets set off really easily. And then I'm just going to stick something in there to disturb it. Once the animal disturbs, whatever little stick I've got in here, let's do this just to show you. Once the animal disturbs this, these two will be under pressure and once they break apart, that will action my trap. Just to make that a little bit more sensitive, I'm going to take this off. What I've done is I've basically taken two of my longest struts and tied them together with a length of paracord that's slightly longer than the two struts themselves are. I'm going to cross it or twist them together so that it forms a cross or an X in the middle what this is doing here. Ideally you want some level ground for this and then what I'm going to do is I'm basically just going to layer cross struts at intervals. So there's the first one, there's the second one and these are quite heavy poles so this is going to be a nice heavy trap. Okay and I just want to apply nice pressure to them to make sure that it is stable. Okay and then I'm going to go in the opposite direction this way, another one this way. Takes a bit of imagination to get the lengths right. Okay, and again, apply pressure to keep them level. And paracord is great for this because paracord is nice and stretchy. Um, twine you can use for other things, other parts of your trap. But um, paracord is the way to go here. This is quite a testimony to paracord, I'll say that. This is spring tight. Okay. 
And one more in the middle should do the trick. That should do it. Just wedge that in between there. Good. Trap done. That's quite solid. Nice big trap. It's quite heavy as well. And I can catch a reasonable size animal in that. So right over here, there's a little game trail that runs past this tree, um, as Indy demonstrated very nicely just a moment ago. So I'm going to set my trap up over here with a little bit of bait on the inside. Um, what I want to do is just position it in such a way that I've got it standing on my little trigger. When the animal sets off the trigger, he'll also trigger the windlass. And when the windlass is triggered, it will actually pull the trap downwards rather than it just falling down with gravity. Luckily, this is really stony ground. I don't see anything really burrowing through this, but yeah, we'll have to see. Okay. I've got a little num num. This is something that the animals in the area like to eat, especially the birds. So even the birds will come in here. And all I've really got to do is to bruise it. Um, even though I don't really, I'm not really keen on losing resources to the animals in the area. I'm going to share a little bit with them and I'm going to eat this piece. Poisonous for dogs, by the way, not for doggy. But the smell of this is gonna lure the animals um, to the area. So I'm putting that inside my trap preferably quite deep so that they'll track quite deep into the trap. So basically how this trap works is I've got a windlass set up over here between these two trees. I've made it really tight um, by twisting the stick inside the rope over there. Um, I've used paracord for it. After I twisted it tight I added on this line over here that basically just secures over the top of it. This line is going to pull taut as soon as this crossbar is disturbed over here. How it's going to pull taut is it comes all the way down here, it goes underneath my v-notch over there and then from my v-notch it attaches to the actual trap. <clears throat> so if the crossbar is disturbed, the windlass turns, it pulls the trap closed so the animal can't lift the trap. Now this line over here will disturb the crossbar if the actual trigger is um, disturbed. Now my trigger in itself is basically the two branches that I fit on top of one another with a tiny little stick in between those two branches. So what will happen if the animal disturbs the twig, it disturbs the, the trigger and the two branches separate. The result is that this crossbar is disturbed by the line because that will fall down. That's also made very sensitive. And on top of that, the trap will close because there's nothing to support it open anymore. So here we go, let's see how it works. So I'm just, going to disturb my little stick well that's it guys my trap works now all that's left for me is to set it up again make it hairline and make sure that it's baited with some num nums and then hopefully through the night I'll catch some animal if you haven't stumbled upon water by now there are a couple of other ways in which you can collect it the first of these is through transpiration so we use a clear plastic bag we put it around a branch of a tree preferably not a poisonous tree because the branch is going to be in the water that you're collecting but inherently the water that you get from evaporation should be good to drink so once again we use the same principle that we use to navigate to water in the first place we want to again establish where north is because i'm in the southern hemisphere the sun is going to pass to you north of me which means that the northern parts of plants or bushes or trees are going to get more sun than the southern parts it's going to be a bit of a waste of time if i set my transpiration bag up on the other side of this bush so in order to establish where north is, we can use a different method. We don't have to make a field compass. You can take an analog watch, and now you must really hope that the time on your watch is set correctly. The ideal is to use just a little stick. So I'm in the southern hemisphere. I'm going to point the 12 o'clock of my watch towards the sun. In the northern hemisphere, you would point the hour hand of your watch towards the sun. I'm going to put just a little stick or a twig on the 12 o'clock and then align it and the shadow of my stick falls over the 12 o'clock and over the 6 o'clock. Now I know I'm pointing directly at the sun and I'm going to draw a line between the hour hand and the 12 o'clock on my watch. So at the moment it's just about 1 o'clock which means that my line is going to go between 12 and 1 and between 6 and 7. So that's going to give me a line that points north. Now north is going to be between my hour hand and the 12 o'clock. Now that's going to give me north. 
So that means that north is now directly ahead of me and south is right behind me. So I'm on the northern side of this bush over here. So I can set my transpiration bag up on this bush um, or on one of these branches and that's going to give me the best chance of collecting water. I've got a bag that has a little string in it and you can use any clear plastic bag. I could even use the one that I used to cross the river or to build a makeshift shelter. In this case, this one is just convenient. I actually keep my bow drill kit in here. The reason why I say it's convenient is because of the draw strip. The other thing I need is a small stone. I'm just rubbing off the worst of the dirt from it. And then I'm going to drop my stone inside my bag. Okay, I'm gonna select a nice big branch. Bring it all together. Okay, so I'm obviously needing a bigger stone the wind doesn't help me. Ideally you want a branch that's drooping downwards. With my bag weighed down all that's left now is to wait for the sun to heat up the bag and you can already see there's some condensation being caught up on the inside. It's actually happening really fast so we should be able to get some water from here within the next three or four hours. How much water that's going to be is anybody's guess. Whether it's actually a viable amount of water, that's going to depend on how many plastic bags you've got. Now, solar stills are another way that you can collect water. That's basically through evaporation. So I've waited about two hours and I've come back to my transpiration bag. And you can see there is quite a bit of condensation on the inside of the bag but it hasn't yielded a whole lot of water only just enough to wet the rocks at the bottom here there's a couple of drops if you've got nothing else that's going to be like gold to you but ideally you'd want to set this up in the morning and let it stay the whole day um, so in in that instance you would get sunlight from the morning right through to the afternoon ideally you also want a plant or a tree that has really broad leaves on it because the smaller the leaves are, the less moisture they're going to hold and the less they're going to transpire, which means less water for you. This is also a good time to start thinking about future fires. So we want to try to conserve our resources as far as possible. So we don't want to continue using our lighter um, because that's a resource that's easily depleted. We don't want to continuously use our ferro rod. So that's why something like a bow drill fire is really nice because the only resource that you are really using um, is basically the energy in your own body. The rest of the stuff um, that is used in a bow drill kit can be found in the environment. Um, so this is my bearing block. I'm keeping it ready because I want to fire hard and get a little bit more. And um, the other thing that I can look at doing now is to make a little bit of char cloth. So that's something that does use one of our resources. We need a little bit of fabric for that. So this one over here is a 100% cotton cloth. And I've got a fire kit that I've emptied out. And I'm basically just going to cut a few pieces of this cloth, put them inside my tin, and that char cloth is gonna help me to start fire with flint and steel. Um, now there is a little bit of a confusion between what a ferro rod is and what flint and steel is. Flint is actually a stone. It's a naturally occurring rock that you find in the bush, usually in riverbeds. And that's basically just taking a steel striker or something that's high carbon steel, going around and taking that high carbon steel and bashing it against the stone to see what you can get sparks off of. So I'm cutting, not very well, but cutting little pieces of fabric and this is just going to help me to ensure that I have multiple ways of starting fires in the future. So that if for whatever reason I can't manage to get a bow fire going, um, I have the option of using flint and steel or I can use a ferro rod and that's why we also keep dry tinder in our bags. Okay, so I'm just going to do a couple. Okay. And once I've got enough pieces of fabric in my tin, maybe just do one more. Um, I can put them on the fire. You don't have to actually make a hole in the tin. You literally can just put the tin on the fire. Very few tins actually seal 100% um, airproof. So I'm just putting that in there. My tin now goes on my fire. I'm going to put it in such a way that I can see 
if there's a flame coming out of this side, then I know that the, the char cloth that I'm busy making is being processed. So that flame is usually given off um, because the synthetic materials and the chemicals that are used to produce that cloth are burning off. So this is an anaerobic environment that I'm creating to process that char cloth. But once the flame goes out, I know that my char cloth is done being processed and I can take my tin off of the fire. Since it's done being processed, I can now take my tin off the fire and I'm just going to let it cool on the side. I don't want to open it just yet because, oh that's hot, if I open it too soon, um, there's so much heat in there that my char cloth is just going to combust. So I reckon my tin has cooled down sufficiently for me to actually open it up and to see whether we've got some usable char cloth in here. Oh, that's smoky fire. Okay. That actually looks pretty good. Char cloth is basically what you would call coal or charcoal, um, but it's made from a very finely woven fabric. Usually we use natural fibers to do it, linen or cotton, and um, that basically is going to take a spark really easily from something like flint and steel. To use flint and steel, I need a tinder bundle. So I'll process that in a second. And this is basically flint stone. So you can see that it's a really clear stone. Um, it's got a really cool color to it. And then a steel striker is basically just something that's made out of really high carbon steel. You can use your knife or you can use something like the spine of a silky saw. So this stuff burns really easily. So I'm just going to give that a little rub. That's going to be the center of my tinder bundle. And this is just some relatively dry grass. Considering that it rained earlier, we're not going to have a whole lot of dry stuff in the area. That's why my fire pops and crackles so much. I'm basically just rubbing the inside to make it really, really fine. And then I'm going to add this really fine stuff that grows along the river as well. Okay. Now, if you really want to not make a fire out of this, you would make a much bigger tinder bundle, but because I've already got a fire going and this is just for demonstration, just the small tinder bundle is going to do it. So it's like a little bird's nest. Now you can, if you find some punk wood, which is basically a really soft, um, almost decaying wood, you can use punk wood um, to start a fire with flint and steel as well. In this case, I'm just going to show you the char cloth. To light the char cloth, all I've really got to do is send some sparks into it. I've just got to hold it up there. Oh. Okay, so you can't see it. Not very clearly. There's a little bit of... But that's showing now but it has actually been lit and now i can just take this char cloth transfer it to my tinder bundle and almost immediately it starts smoking and when your tinder bundle is really nicely processed the job is pretty much done and you've just got to wait and see that it actually catches a light. That's it. Fire. If your fire gets to the point where it starts to make a whole lot of ash, um, let's say it's pretty much gone out, you can now start to think about fire hardening things. So this is a bearing block that I use for my bow drill. I fire hardened it before, but because I'm constantly drilling in that notch, I can re-fire harden that notch or re-harden that notch in the fire. So what I want to do is I just want to place it in among the ashes. I don't want it to catch a light, so I've got to be really careful to make it warm, but not so warm that it will catch a light. So I'm just going to leave it there in the hot ash. I can put some stuff on top of it just to make sure it gets all of the heat. Vital to recognize the resources that you have at your disposal in the wilderness. From being in the fire, some of these rocks have split and are left with some very sharp edges. 
We can easily use some of these as cutting tools once they've cooled down. Like this one here. That's pretty sharp and I can nap it a little to refine the edge and make an arrowhead or some spear tips from that. Okay. This guy is looking pretty good for fire hardening. It's warm now and um, I'm pretty sure the sparing block is gonna last quite a bit longer still. Well, thanks so much for watching. Don't leave without dropping a comment below. Let me know if you've got any more survival tips. I'd love to hear from you guys. And until the next time, live ready.